there's this general misconception and it's a really bad one that shipping is like full of a bunch of idiots and like they're all scoundrels or whatnot and the truth is many of these shipping companies i mean especially the european ones have phenomenal corporate governance how long should tankers... people have to wait before tankers <laughs> take a move <laughs> broken clocks <laughs> broken clocks now look um you know there's people that have been bullish on tankers every day of their life for two years and and you know Tankers are in a good market again. But no, 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 look, look. How would you summarize this year so far? One hectic year, one for the record books. Now with investing and trading, what a roller coaster. I mean, January through March was the most profitable run, most profitable open we've ever had. Uh, look, man, <laughs> then, then the earthquake set in. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I'm super excited to once again be joined by Jay. And Jay, thank you so much for taking the time to join again. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I, I really enjoyed the, the talk that we had last year, and I'm, I'm glad to be back on your show again. Your show has grown a lot. I've, I've seen that you've done a lot of shipping interviews. You've also done a lot of business talks. So congrats on, on your success there. No, th thank you so much. Uh, before we hit record, we, we had a quick con conversation, of course, but how would you summarize this year so far? I mean, you have a lot of things going on in your life. How would you summarize it so people can get the context? <laughs> well, in a personal sense, I mean, it's been just keeping afloat. I mean, I've been so busy with academics, with school, with other commitments, not to even mention all the research and the investing and everything that's been going on. So it's been one hectic year, one for the record books. Now with investing and trading, what a roller coaster. I mean, January through March was the most profitable run, most profitable open we've ever had. Um, at one point, uh, our models were up 40 something percent and that's long only, no leverage, no options, just long only 40%. The market was down 15, um, so we're crushing it. My, my personal account was up 110% year to date at the end of March uh, in three months. Uh, Look, man, <laughs> then, then the earthquake set in. Um, since March, it's been a lot of ups and downs. And the last, we're recording this on, on June 15th. And uh, I had to bring, my wife's a social worker, and I had to fill my coffee up and put it in her mug today. It's radiant positive energy. Because <laughs> the last two or three weeks, Chris, have been, oh my God, just brutal. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's all relative. And we said this in the opening. I, I said, look, the market's down 20, 25%. Our models of Value Investors Edge are up 40, as we're talking, they're at 41% year to date. Uh, my PA, as we're talking, is up 53% year to date. So, so Chris, I don't want to come on here and, and, and give the wrong vibe. But when you, when you get your face kicked in in three weeks, I mean, literally half my gains year to date were knocked out the last three weeks. So that's tough. Um, I'm just trying to radiate positive energy, Chris. <laughs> No, I think that's a great summary. But like when you have this kind of markets, how do you try to, you know, have that right, you know, mindset looking at the market? Because, you know, when there are so huge volatility in the market, it's, it's easy to get affected, right? So how conscious are you about sort of the mindset you have when you're trying to work through all these things happening in the market? Because it's very easy to be affected, right? Like nobody says Absolutely. they're affected, but like it's, it's human yeah. behavior. Absolutely, you get affected. And there's a lot of emotions, a lot of regret, a lot of second guessing, a lot of hindsight. Uh, look, I mean, fundamentally, I have to remember my roots and where I excel at. And that's always been sort of the investment approach, medium term, anywhere from about six months to two years. Uh, I'm not a good trader. And I've said that to folks all the time. Like, I, I'm a little bit contrarian wired. So whenever momentum is running off in a certain direction, I tend to want to lean the other direction that's not necessarily good for a trader, right? And so, for example, the last few weeks, there's been a lot of momentum and a lot of excitement around some of the tanker stocks. And I have nothing against, you know, the tanker fundamental thesis per se. Like I was long tankers earlier this year, but it seems a little overheated and a little overdone. So I, I tend to lean against that. And then I look at containers and there's been this huge sell-off on what, and we can get into this more later and follow-ups and stuff, but what more or less amounts to faulty narrative. And so I'm, I'm prone, the, the stocks are going down and I'm prone to lean bullish into that. That might be good for six months or 12 months, Chris. And we don't know. We'll have to go back in six months or 12 months. I, I've been doing a lot on, on tweets recently where I say, at, you know, remind me in one year, right? Because I do want to see how we do. Uh, but Chris, it's not always good for trading. And, and I have been totally, I don't want to say totally wrong, but yeah, I mean, when you're trading, you're right and wrong is making and losing money. 
It's as simple as that. And, and I've been pretty wrong, Chris, the last two or three weeks. This uh, It's June 15th. Uh, ever since about the last week of May through the middle of June, uh, I haven't had a hot hand in trading. It, it has been rough. What has surprised you the most recently? Are there any events in particular that really surprised you and took your card? Well, <laughs> geopolitically, this year has been just wild. I mean, there, there's too many things to count. Uh, I mean, uh, the Russian invasion, I think, um, at least the magnitude of it, right? It wasn't just, as Putin says, a special operation. I mean, it was a full-on invasion. That, that was a big shift in geopolitical events. Um, that's the big one. There's little ones that are surprises and little things. Like, for example, the, the Freeport LNG explosion that just happened a couple of days ago. That was a big shock to the natural gas markets in the United States. That was a pretty big surprise. Um, the thing that surprised me the most, I think, and I should know better, Chris, so it almost surprises me that I, it surprises me that it surprised me, I guess, is the market's total lack of any sort of discretion for container shipping firms and the differences between them. So let me give you an example. There's Zim Integrated Shipping, ZIM, and that is a very popular stock, but it's a pretty cheap stock. It trades less than one times earnings once you take cash out. So it's a cheap stock, but it's risky, Chris. I mean, it's basically, they have some one-year freight contracts, but it's like 75% exposed to spot freight rates for the revenues. Meanwhile, most of their expenses are fixed for the next couple of years. Zim is a kind of risky company, Chris. Like, and I've always been straight with people about that, and I've made a lot of money on Zim, but it's a risky company. So, you know, in, in events like the last few weeks where people start running around like chickens with their heads cut off, it's not surprising to see Zim fade back, okay? But what surprised me is there's absolutely zero discretion in the market between a stock like Zim, that is kind of risky, and a stock like Denouse Corp, DAC, or Global Ship Lease, GSL. I'm long all three of these right now, by the way. Uh, those stocks, DAC and GSL, are very, very safe. It's hard to find a safer stock in shipping. And I've been in shipping for 12, 13 years. And I, those are some of the safest, cheapest stocks that, are, that have ever existed in shipping. And they've just been destroyed. The Denouse Corp fell from 107 to the mid 60s. Uh, GSL fell from 30 to 19. I mean, these are in big pullbacks. These are 35, 40% pullbacks. And these are very safe, very strong stocks that have like no exposure to the next year or two of cash flow. So I just, sorry for the long winded answer, Chris. And it's probably embarrassing that that surprises me. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff in shipping, Chris. And, and, and but I just, it's way overdone and it's totally out of proportion. Another late day at the office, busy with dial up earnings calls, buried in annual reports, transcripts, and. Wait, what? There's an app for that? Good morning, everyone. We are glad you can join us. Quarter is the world's fastest growing investor relations app. With Quarter in your hand, you get frictionless access to earnings reports, slide decks, earnings calls, and transcripts literally anywhere in the world. Visit your app store of choice and download Quarter today. And the best part, it's 100% free. Since you mentioned containers, because I wanted to just give the listeners a brief sort of introduction or summary of the different segments in the shipping industry. So let's just talk about containers firstly, because at least from my observation on Twitter, it seems like that's a very hot debate right now, sort of the container outlook going forward, right? So can you just shut some light on what are the different perspectives? Why are you still pretty like bullish on containers and why some people say it's it's, it's very at the peak and now it's yeah. about time and the race will go down? So can you just yeah. sum, summarize that debate? For the, the well, I'm not, a, I'm not a super old hat in the sector, Chris, but I've been here, been here a while. And, and I think there's a lot of folks to shipping that are fairly new, um, whether that's six months, 12 months, one or two years. Uh, and there's a lot of folks in the market who are new. And, and there's a lot of folks who are driving and leading conversation uh, that are fairly new, let's be honest. And there's sort of, I think a lot of folks in shipping learned the wrong lessons from 2020 and 2021 and, and that whole last cycle. There's a lot of folks who think in shipping, you just buy low and sell high on rates. When the rates are terrible, you buy the stocks. When the rates are high, you sell the stocks because the rates can only go down and the rates can only go up. Look, that's a recipe. If you always buy low rates, that's a recipe for dead money, first of all. Second of all, if you always sell the high rates, well, what's the nuance? Are they chartered in for three or four or five years? Are they spot rates? What's the difference? I think a lot of folks got into shipping with tankers way back in 2020. Tanker gang. <laughs> and uh, there's rates were insane, Chris. You remember, I mean, I think you were starting to pay attention back then. And 
$200,000 a day for VLCCs. And like every day we were all looking at the fixtures and celebrating. And it was, it was crazy, but those were 60 day, 80 day voyages. These were spot. And so when the tide went out and that tide went out fast, because it was, it was all based on oil storage, right? So once, once OPEC shut off the supply and the global demand plummeted and stayed plummeted, tankers were just crushed. And folks learned this wrong lesson that like every time there's a rally, I should short it. Or every time the rates are high, I should get out because the rates can only go down. Well, container ships are an entirely different sort of subsegment. It, it has almost nothing in common with tankers. It's an industrial type play. They're three to five year leases. So you got companies like the Naus Corp and Global Ship Lease. And I've been, I mean, look, there's things like broken clocks, right? A broken clock's right twice a day. I've been debating, you know, with folks on Twitter and such. And, and I'm, not, I'm not right all the time, Chris. Like, I'll, I'll be wrong. And, and I'm, I could be wrong on this one, right? I, I make mistakes. But I've been debating with folks on Twitter for like 13, 14 months straight, 15 months straight. It's getting tiring. It's been the same thing over and over and over. The containers ran too high. They can only come down. You're buying at the peaks. I've always guided my investment decisions with fundamental cash flow models, always. And that's what got me into containers last year. That's what kept me in them last year. That's why this year I'm not too worried about them. Fundamentally, a company like Denaus Corp, DAC, or Global Ship Lease, GSL, and I'm, I'm long both these companies, I'm talking my book, but both these companies trade significantly below the net present value of their contracts that are already been signed. And if you include the residual value of the, sh- of the fleet at demolition. So the contract you've already signed, you demolish the ship, and it's worth more than what the stock trades for. So like, who cares if rates go down? Like, duh, like they're going to go down. They're too high. Like no shit, Sherlock. Like I it just, it, it doesn't make, it's just it, the funny thing at last point, <laughs> I can tell a little bit, I got to radiate positive energy now. But like the funny thing is some of these folks that are super anti-containers, like they hold themselves out as they're like independent thinkers or contrarians, but that's like the market view. Like the market's been like anti-shipping and containers for like a year straight. So like, it's not even a contrarian view. It's like consensus. And and look, dude, if you're trading it and you're making money, good on you. Like keep doing it, keep making money. I'm not, I'm not mad if someone's shorting my stocks. Like, I think it's crazy. People get mad when someone shorts your stock, like buy, sell, it's a market, man. It it makes a market and that's what it is. That's a great summary. Looking at another segment. So that of course, get a lot, a lot of attention. Twitter is of course the tankers. What is, what is your summary on that segment right now? How long do people have to wait before tankers <laughs> <take a> move? <laughs> broken clocks, <laughs> broken clocks. Now look, um, you know, there's people that have been bullish on tankers every day of their life for two years and, and, you know, tankers are in a good market again, but no, 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 no. Look, look, look. Tankers fundamentally product tankers fundamentally look really good right here. There's no denying that. I mean, I, like I, we just had an interview with Robert Bugby of Scorpio. We just talked to Jakob Mildgaard of, of Torm over the last two weeks on, on Value Investors Edge. Uh, both those gentlemen very well in tune with this sector, very very well dialed in. Lots of good facts that they were they were sharing. The, the sector looks fundamentally very good. The stocks, however, technically they're very overheated. They're way overbought. And if you look at valuation metrics, if you look at forward cash flows, if you look at net asset value. The stocks have already priced in a lot of that bullishness. Now, is there more upside ahead? Yeah, there could be more upside ahead. But if those rates don't pan out, if those rates weaken or go down, or if we get this big recession that everyone's like worried about, those stocks aren't going to do well. And and, and that's what worries me on on tanker stocks is that it's all spot. And we don't know what the next six months are going to be. I can tell you it's looking bullish. But I want a discount to that. I don't want to just, I don't want to pay market. I don't want to pay NAV for something just because I think it's bullish. That's already reflected in the NAV. I think a lot of people don't get that. Like the NAV changes every day and every week. And it's based on real time secondhand transactions. So if the market's more bullish, the NAV goes up. If the market's more bearish, the NAV goes down. So if you're buying into a very excitable, very optimistic market and you're paying NAV, like, it's not the same as paying NAV last year, right? Like the NAV, something like Scorpio tankers is in the thirties. The NAV of Scorpio tankers last year was 15. So you're not getting like a great deal here. And, and that's what I tell folks. It's all about risk reward. And you can buy tankers here, Chris, and the rates can go really high and you can make a lot of money 
Like I'm not saying like I'm, I'm not negative tankers. I'm just saying the way I position myself, and this is 12, 13 years in this sector, it's all about risk reward. And with a container ship firm like Denaus or Global Ship Lease, I know that I can buy that stock today. And the worst possible case scenario is that I make 20 or 30% a year. Worst possible case. Medium case, 50, 60%. Best case, more than double. If I buy a tanker stock, worst case, I might lose half my money. Base case, I don't know, maybe make a little bit. Bull case, yeah, I could triple my money. But I can lose a lot of money on those stocks. And that's, that's all it is, Chris. And I hope that's, I'm trying to simplify it enough. You know, I'm not trying to get too far into nuances of, you know, ton mile demand shifts and things like that, but that's kind of risk reward in a nutshell. And, and that's how I think about the whole container ship sector and shipping sector and even other stocks, like even energy stocks. I look at the risk reward and I say like, what happens if oil goes up? What happens if oil goes down? Where are these companies going to go? That's a great summary. Just um, talking about another bet that has gone very good recently is, of course, the dry bulk sector. So it also seems like there are positive energy towards that yeah. sector. Are, are you also quite positive on the tra trajectory going forward? <laughs> dry bulk for me is similar to tankers. Look, I, I have long dry bulk positions. Um, I do. I have several longs. I actually had a short, but I, I closed it out recently. It was, uh, I, well, I guess I closed it. So <laughs> it was uh, Diana shipping DSX. But um, yeah, I mean, dry bulk similar to tankers. Like, yeah, the fundamentals are interesting and somewhat positive. But like, look, the stocks are already kind of, I don't want to say high. High is kind of a <laughs> divisive word. I'm going to make a lot of enemies on this show, Chris. <laughs> but look, it's it's kind of priced in, bud. Like, I mean, it's just, it's like some of these energy firms. Like, I, don't get me wrong. I'm bullish energy. I have some energy positions. But like, dude, like, if you're worried about a global recession, like, you got to be careful on some of these stocks. And, and dry bulk is 100%. I mean, really, when you, when, it, when you boil it down, Chris, it's 100% China. Like if China, if China recovers and reopens, dry bulk's gonna crush it. If China falls on its face, dry bulk's not gonna do well. <laughs> like, it's just, sometimes the simplest one sentence like explanation of a sector is best. And for dry bulk, it's, it's China. I, I mean, it really is. We can talk about ton miles and grain and Ukraine crisis yeah. and like coal and, you know, but no, it's all about China. And, I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm bewildered about this like religious insistence on zero COVID. I just, Chinese have always been very pragmatic at the end of the day. Like, I mean, they, you might not agree with their governance. You might not agree with their market system, but they're usually pragmatic at the end of the day. And this zero COVID thing, it's like, there's like this concrete wall and they're just like bashing their head into it. And I just, I probably just leave it at that, but yeah. <laughs> And just let's go through the, the last sector, of course, the, the LNG and also LPG, if you want. So what is sort of the, the bird's eye view on that sector right now, speaking at this specific time? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great. You're, you're hitting me on every sector now. I'm giving away too much here. <laughs> Look, LNG was like tankers, but worse. I mean, if you wanted to find the most overvalued stocks in the market, look at LNG. Um, that's different now. The stocks crashed. It's just funny. They all crashed because of like Freeport explosion. It's like the Freeport explosion is like 90 days, man. Like you guys betting on 90 days? Like this is a five-year story. Like, I don't, but anyways, Freeport LNG explosion happened. That cooled off that bubble. And, and now you have stocks like, I just talked to OSG, uh, Kaliklev just a, just a couple of days ago. And I have so much respect for, for him and for Flex LNG and all the work he's done. But I'll be honest, uh, two weeks ago, I was short Flex. Uh, I was my second largest short. And it was just the stock was overvalued. I have, I've since covered, I actually covered two days ago. Um, it was via puts um, and those puts have been sold. Um, very profitable puts, um, which, which I've been getting my face kicked in. So that was like the one source of like relief. <laughs> <It> was like <laughs> Diana shipping and Flex shorts. But anyways, the problem with LNG is that there's not very many stocks to pick from. And you got a stock like Flex, which is a fantastic company. I don't like people get that mixed all the time. Like you're short a company, you don't like them. No, I love Flex. Great company. I love the management team. Great management team. Um, but it's it was trading 130% nav and all the vessels were locked in. They only have two ships coming open and they don't come open until next year. So, you know, where's the excitement there? Um, one company, I will say no position. So I'm not talking my book. I'm just being honest. Uh, really cool company. You absolutely have to be following it. Uh, well, I guess a pun there because the company's goal are GLNG, but they have a spinoff called Cool Company. And those are two stocks 
that are very interesting, very worth following. I do not have positions personally. Um, I followed Golar for like almost a decade now. Uh, I'm very interested in cool. They've only had one quarter uh, post spinoff and it was kind of a messy quarter. So the financials are still kind of in flux. Uh, I'll be meeting with their CFO next week at Marine Money at the conference and uh, really excited about those two companies. No positions, but I just think that you need to put them on your watch list. If you're in shipping, those two comp- companies are not on your watch list, like fix it. <laughs> LPG, a little bit different than LNG. Fundamentally, those companies are cheap. Um, they're interesting to me. Uh, I am worried about next year's order book. 2023 has a massive, massive set of deliveries coming up. And I am skeptical that the market can absorb even half maybe of those deliveries. Um, I mean, we're talking like 47 ships can hit the water. And I think that's too much. Um, there's other companies in the space that are very interesting that are on my watch list. Uh, one of them's really cool. Uh, I kind of stopped using the word cool now. I've, <laughs> it's like the word gets stuck in your head. Uh, Navigator, NVGS. Um, no position, personally. Um, so I'm just, again, just talking about interesting companies that you need to be following. Uh, a good friend of mine, Randy Givens, was the analyst, uh, head of shipping analyst at Jefferies, and now he is the head of IR and um, project development at, at Navigator Holdings. And they're doing, they're doing LPG, they're doing ethylene, ethane, basically all the natural gas liquids. And they're looking into more export facilities across the United States. So I think Navigator, you got to have it on your watch list. Golar, you got to have it on your watch list. If you want to trade LNG stocks and have fun, you got to look at cool company. Um, there's some other ones, Gaslog Partners. Um, I am long a company called Capital Product Partners, CPLP. They don't own any product tankers. <laughs> so I don't know why they're called Capital Product Partners. Um, it's a stupid name, but uh, CPLP. And uh, they have very large LNG fleet, all ultra modern, excellent contracts. Uh, some new container ship drops they're getting that are on ultra long contracts, very good economics. And the company's kind of hated. They have some governance issues, to put it mildly. Uh, the dividend is way smaller than it should be. This dividend is uh, 15 cents a quarter. And so they're paying, you know, 60 cents a year and, you know, the stock's 15 bucks. So, you know, 3% dividend or whatever. And this dividend, it's covered like 10 times by cash flows. So think about that. It's 3% yield is covered 10 times by cash flows. This company could have a 30% yield or higher if they had a full payout. And the whole fleet, all the new ships are on five, six, seven, eight year contracts. Um, so it's an extremely cheap company, but it's got its warts. It's got its problems. Um, yeah, CPLP. <laughs> so hopefully that's a lot of companies. Hopefully that's at least helpful for folks who are getting into the sector and, and looking at stuff. Yeah, definitely. But once we're now we're talking about all the different sectors and all the different companies you have been searching and, you know, doing research on, how do you structure this process? Like what's your discovery path? Do you have a specific structure or routine you follow to gather the overview or is it a lot about serendipity and talking to people? Because how do you structure all this to have to, to have it in your mind and also to, to calculate it, of course? Yeah, I, I mean, a great question. And, and as we go on and, and get years and years deeper into this, it's really more all of the above. Um, it was a challenge, Chris, when I when I launched Value Investors Edge in 2015, seven seven years ago. Uh, it was a challenge to build up that database and to build up all that research because I was starting from not zero. I mean, I knew what these companies were, but I was starting from like you know square two, you know, not square one. But uh, now we have all of our models set up across all these companies. We have a full function data analytics service. We have a what we call a scenario editor that lets you plug in bearish, semi-bearish, base, bullish, super bullish. And you can just click a button. It's, it's pretty cool. We got a coder that is really helping out a lot on this, help our team out. You can just click a button and pick a scenario and it like spits out all the outcomes. So you're like, oh, I'm really bullish on tankers. Let me plug this in. Oh, holy cow, I'm really bullish on company, on tankers. I should buy Scorpio tankers, right? Like it, it literally like directs you into like, kind of doesn't direct you, it's a spreadsheet, but it like helps you find out, you know, what what's beneficial. So. The micro stuff, I don't want to say it's automated, but it's basically like it's been built. We've built it. Uh, so that, that, that speeds the process up big time, Chris. The macro side is always more open to interpretation. Uh, that, but that's more, almost like a Rorschach test. You know, you can see kind of what you want to see on that. We have a guy who's worked with us. He's really, I can, he's a partner in, in the business. Let's just call it what it is. A fantastic guy. His name's James Catlin. And he's done a lot of macro reports for us. And, and he's 
I've worked with James since 2016. So basically right after I started the, the business and he does almost all of that. Um, so if I want to talk big, high picture about trade flows or something, you know, James Catlin writes a report on it, or I call James Catlin on the phone and talk to him. And like, it's not like I'm totally ignorant, have no idea what's going on, but like, that's his specialty. So like, you know, stay in your lane, you know? So we just had an interview with James on our VIE live platform. It was about an hour long and, and folks could send in questions. I kind of like what we're doing only, you know, it was just audio. And, and, and that's the macro side of it. That's the supply and demand. That's looking at the order books. That's looking at trade flows. James does a phenomenal job. We have another guy who does, helps out with the modeling and the earnings forecasts. And he's been on some earnings calls. Uh, some of y'all might've heard of me. His name's Clement Mullins. A uh, fantastic uh, young gentleman who's, who's been working with us. Uh, we got a guy who does our coding that I mentioned um, that helps out a lot. We have an energy guy that I work with. His name's Michael Boyd. Uh, so I guess the point I'm making here, Chris, is you have your data, right? You have your tools, which I've talked to you about the, the scenario editor and the analytics platform. And you have your team. You have your specialists across the sectors. And they're each doing their own thing. So it's not just, I'm not just looking for a cheap company. I'm not just looking for, you know, what macro looks good. I'm taking all that and putting it together. And, and that's how we derive our fair value estimates. And that's how we derive, you know, what has good risk and good reward. And, and it wouldn't be fair to, you know, our members to go through every single stock and say, you know, which one has the highest fair value and which one has the best risk reward. Um, but we do that across all the companies that we follow and, and that sort of thing. And, and, I've, and I've, I've, I've spilled the beans uh, publicly that, you know, container ships have by far the best risk reward. I mean, it's just, it's not even close um, compared with the other segments. And, you know, tankers, uh, the risk reward just isn't there. Interesting. Very interesting. Just like from an investment perspective, like do you only focus on shipping and energy and let everything else just like completely stays away? Or do you have a curiosity at looking at other stocks as well to sort of see if there's, I mean, can you learn something from other investors and in other sectors? So do you feel like, shipping is in its own lane for good reasons or are there you know reasons to be inspired by other analysts other investors in completely different fields right well everything in the world is is somewhat interconnected right there, there's it's nothing is nothing is in stasis or in isolation by itself um however i stay in shipping in my lane for a good reason um it's the industry where i have proven year in and year out uh we're on our seventh year now that we have repeated industry outperformance and I mean, it's, we have a chart that shows in seven years. I, you've probably seen it on, on Twitter or whatnot. I mean, it's, it, it's not close. Um, and that's been proven. So that's why I stay in that lane, Chris. It's like, it's like when Michael Jordan decided he wanted to play baseball. Like, what are you doing, my guy? Like, I'm not going to go like try to talk about tech stocks or biotech or, you know, and, and, and Chris, sometimes that means shipping's hot and it's popular like it was last year. And sometimes that means that everybody hates shipping and thinks you're a moron. I mean, that t early to mid 2020, like I never really had hate mail. Like nobody wanted to like murder me, or at least they didn't express that. Like I've never had a death threat. <laughs> Please don't let's not let's not make this the invitation. But like, I, people are generally have been okay. But I was not a well liked person in in 2020 across like a lot of the investment spheres. Like a lot of people were like, Jay's an idiot or Jay's a quack or I mean, you say quack, but like, he like basically doesn't know what he's talking about. And of course that was the best time in history to ever buy shipping stocks. Right. But like people hated me. And, you know, a few months ago, like, you know, I was fairly popular. So like I, one guy told me once, he was a hedge fund guy. And he said, look, man, when everybody thinks that you're like Jesus on water, like, <laughs> It's time to GTFO, you know, like cash, cash out, baby. Um, and when everyone thinks that you're a freaking idiot, like that's when you mortgage the house and go, you know, all in, right? And, and, and you know, that was kind of generalist speak, but he wasn't, he wasn't all wrong, uh, you know. And, and but all that said, Chris, I've demonstrated in good years and bad years and mediocre years, we've done well in shipping. Chris, if I, I, I think the Michael Jordan thing summed it up, right? I mean, I, why would I go? Why would I just putter around in something I don't understand? I'm gonna hire. Some, if I really, if I really have an inkling, I'm like, gosh darn! I like, I really want some tech stocks. I'm gonna go find some guy that I believe is trustworthy, has integrity, seems smart, and I'm just gonna give him some money, or maybe not give him the money, but I'm gonna buy his research, and I'm just gonna kind of—I hate to put it this simply, but I'm just kind of gonna do what he recommends or she re she recommends, right? Um, I'm not gonna like try to reinvent the wheel, like. I, uh, do you do your own plumbing in your house? Do you, did you install your water heater? Uh, maybe you did, but like, 
you know, it's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. No, it definitely makes sense. Just looking at the market more broadly, because um, I heard one of your presentations where you sort of created this bull scenario about, you know, the market. And it made me think like, from if you're a new investor, how do you separate, you know, bull markets from super cycles? Because obviously, we know that shipping is cyclical, it goes up and down. But how do you know if this is a super cycle or not? How, how does that thought process look in your mind when you're thinking about this? Uh, I mean, how much does your account value go up? <laughs> it's a super cycle. No, I, I mean, it's in the beholder. I don't know if there's an official definition between a bull market and a super cycle. I, I mean, I, I consider a super cycle to be something that lasts for several years and it, it is literally off the charts. Like we're talking, you know, when people say this is like we're in the 60th percentile of rates or the 80th percentile of rates, right? Meaning that, you know, it's stronger than the other 80. Uh, a super cycle is something that lasts for several years, in my opinion, and the, and the rates are 90 to 99.9 percentile. So container ship leasing, obviously a super cycle. You pull up the context chart, you pull up the Harpex, we are literally off the charts. Like they've never been there before. And it's lasted for two years. Well, um, actually, eh, 19 months, 20 months. But look, Chris, the last one. Hopefully folks know this who are listening to this have been in shipping, but container ship leasing rates have went up week over week for the last five and a half, six weeks. So like the narrative out there says they're doing badly. The rates are up the last six weeks. So the super cycle is still ongoing, just, just, just to throw that out there. But that's a super cycle. A bull cycle, look, I mean, tankers, product tankers are in a bull cycle right now. Dry bulk is in a bull cycle. We're in like 80th percentile rates right now. People might not think that. The rates don't sound that great. You know, Cape size, you know, Cape size, we're at what earlier, what, 30, 35,000, uh, mid size, we're at 30,000. Those are 80, 80, 90 percentile type rates. I mean, they're pretty good, um, but they're not super cycle, right? It, it come back to me with a hundred thousand dollar Cape size rates and we can talk about a dry bulk super cycle, right? That's a great way of putting it. Talking about another factor that is on a lot of people's minds is of course the new regulations and how that will play in going forward. Again, sort of your view on how this will play out. Vessels have to slow down. I don't know how many has to go to scrapping, et cetera, but how does this, does this play a look from sort of the regulation standpoint that, you know, there are some big regulations ready to, to enter the market soon? Yeah, that, that's, been a, that's been a fundamental part of my general bullishness on shipping for the last year and a half. The regulations are artificially going to constrain the supply side. So whenever you look at the order book numbers, you have to shave that down a little bit. Whenever you look at how the fleet is bifurcated or in LNG, it's trifurcated. There's actually three buckets of different types of ships and technologies. Uh, most of the ship, most of the other ships are, I would say, bifurcated. Uh, you got the stuff that was built before. Yeah, it's a rough cutoff, but like 2013, 2014, it's kind of the legacy designs and everything built from like 2014 to modern usually has things like bulb, bulbous bows and expanded propellers, engine speed limiters, uh, smart controls, things like that, that are eco design. So it's kind of like, you know, two classes of ships and, and those regulations that start, they start in January 23. And, and, and for some folks who might not know, they don't all kick in on January 23. The survey limit, the survey design and everything kicks in whenever a ship goes for a special survey. So it's a five year implementation period. It's kind of like when we had ballast water treatment per, uh, systems a few years back. So it's going to start January 23, but the impact is going to be blended 23, 24, 25, 26, and 2027. So it's a five-year blended period. And each year, more and more ships are going to go to their survey and get impacted. And each year, the carbon intensity requirements, the CII, go higher and higher. Or at least, the, I mean, the, you understand what I'm saying? The, the carbon you can make goes lower and lower, which means the stringency of the regulations goes higher and higher. So it's not just a January 23 one shot. It's a five-year period of artificially constraining supply more and more and more and more as we go through that. Um, meanwhile, Chris, we have the lowest order book in modern history in tankers and dry bulk. Like, wait a minute, Jay, didn't you just tell me that you know, these stocks weren't that interesting? Look, I mean, I think, I think they are. I think the thing that's holding me back on dry bulk is China. And the thing that's holding me back on crude tankers, especially, is the same reasons I think folks don't like containers. They're like, dude, this global economy is long in the tooth. We have inflation everywhere. We have central banks panicking. We have tightening rates. We have, you know, quantitative tightening. Uh, you know, that's, those are not environments that tankers do well in. Product tanker dislocation because of Ukraine, certainly a factor, definitely a factor. How long is it going to last? I don't know. We don't know. Every time we look at the news in Ukraine, things are a little different. 
you know, two months ago, you, you would have thought the Ukrainians were super soldiers and, and <laughs> going to push Russia back to Stalingrad. And you turn on the news this morning and it doesn't look so good over there. Right. So I'm not here to make prognications on, on the war. Right. Um, but what I am saying is, you know, think about what can happen in different macro environments, global environments, and think about what that means to your sector. That aside, back to what you're saying about the regulations, overall, very, very bullish on the supply side. But you got to have demand meet up to its bargain. You can't just have a good supply. You got to have both of them working together a little bit. How confident are you that you're seeing you know, this big recession coming in? Is it a bit early to say yet, or are you pretty confident that we're going to see something close or similar to a recession going forward? I mean, I'm actually probably less bearish than consensus on, on, on a global recession. I'm just saying it's a risk, um, which is funny because I'm kind of a perma bear. Like people who've known me for many years, like I was the guy who like sold all my index holdings. I, I didn't know COVID was coming, obviously. I sold all my index holdings in my like, you know, 401k and, and everything else in late 2019. Just sold all of it, went all cash because I didn't like the index valuations. They seemed overvalued. Um, I looked like a genius when COVID hit, <laughs> but then I kept my 401k in all cash and I looked like a moron, you know, for the next year. Uh, so it's, you know, win some, you lose some. Point being, I'm, I'm a cautious guy. Like I'm the kind of guy that would have been telling you the economy is overheated. However, at this point, you know, I look at all these surveys and I, I was on Wall Street Bets the other day. If you want to find like the ultimate like contra, you know, sorry guys, um, but you can find like the ultimate contra indication, like go to Wall Street Bets and see what those guys are saying. And they're like 90% bearish. And then I saw a, um, last week was the largest hedge fund outflow in equities. I think in, I, I can't remember if it was years or might've been decades was last week from hedge funds. And then last fall, institutional survey put out by Barron's. So Barron's is like the equivalent of Wall Street bets for like smart money. <laughs> So sorry, bears. But uh, they had an institutional survey last fall and institutionalists were the most bearish they've been in like 20 years. So it's like everybody is bearish. And I just, at some point, it's a market. And at some point that's priced in. And so, okay. I think I'm probably more bearish on the actual economy, but not necessarily bearish on the markets. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think like the markets are kind of like already pricing in a lot of that economic problem. Yeah, I mean, it's an important distinction there, like the real economy and the markets, yeah. because they don't always, you know, that's at the same rhythm and the same pace. No, like Main Street is going like downhill fast. Like there's no doubt. Like if you look at the housing indexes and you look at the ho average housing rate prices, you look at inflation, you look at wage growth, which, I, and, I, and this, is, this is a travesty, you know, wage, real wage growth is negative in the United States. People are getting poorer. At the same time, they're getting poorer, food and oil and gas are getting more expensive. Their only saving grace has been expanding real estate property values. Those are about to go off a cliff. So yeah, no, Main Street, like I'm bearish on that. I just, I just think that the stock market's kind of already like, it's kind of already pricing all that in. Yeah, definitely. I want to take some Twitter questions, Jay, because we got, sure. we got a lot of them coming in. So the first one is that I think we touched upon this briefly at the start, but the question is, is it a problem for valuation that most people don't understand shipping and segments? Is it a problem? Look, if, if the market was perfect and everybody understood all the valuations and things traded efficiently, like I wouldn't have a business. <laughs> so like, like you know, we wouldn't make any money. Like you just buy an index and that'd be it. So no, like that's the entire reason I'm in this sector is because it's so crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, like no, no, but I, I get the. Per I don't want to laugh. No, it's a good question. I, yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it's a problem, but it's a problem we can profit from. So like, don't wish it away. It, it just goes back to when there's a problem, there's often opportunity, right? So this is exactly. a perfect example for that, right? Exactly. And it's not just shipping. There's other segments. The, what makes shipping so interesting, there, there's really a few things. One of them is the, the market caps are too small for most institutions to play in. They're just small. I mean, they're 200 million, maybe on the small side, maybe the biggest company. Zim is like the biggest company I've ever dealt with. And they were like 7, 8 billion at the, at the top. So like not a huge company, right? So big institutional players can't play in there. And second of all, a lot of things that happen in shipping are totally counterintuitive. Like COVID-19 was like, COVID-19 was probably the most bullish thing that could ever have possibly happened to container ship. But like, imagine telling some average guy in the street in like May of 2020, when, you know, lockdowns are happening, that like shipping is going to be the biggest winner of all of this. 
It just doesn't make sense, right? When the Ukraine invasion happened, I had a lot of people asking me, personal friends, you know, hey, Jay, like you're in shipping, right? Like, isn't this terrible for shipping? Like, aren't these tankers and bulkers, like they're just going to lose supply and this is terrible for shipping, Jay? And I'm like, no, dude, it's actually like pretty bullish for product tankers. It's actually like mid-sized bulk is probably going to make money on this thing. And they're like, really? What? Why? And, and so like, not only are their stocks small, they're often like the consensus or like every man's logic is so bad. And that goes into container ships right now. The every man logic is like, oh, the rates are high. They can only go down. Like shipping's done. Like Target like has too much inventory. Like, well, first of all, Target just blows at inventory management. But secondly, like, secondly, like that's consensus. That's already known. What isn't known is that maybe all these companies have three to five year leases already. Maybe there's very little ship delivery until middle to late 2023. But there's a lot of nuances in there that make shipping very interesting. Good answer. Uh, next one. What's your view on front line? <laughs> do, you ever say bad, do you ever say bad answer, Chris? I, <laughs> You're like, terrible I, answer, Jay. <laughs> I haven't done yet, but let's see. We could see let, let's see how it goes further, right? So right, the, yeah, uh, the, view, the view on Frontline and Euronav merger, I mean, it's got a lot of debate, of course, and a lot of people excited about that. Are you also on the excited end of that spectacle? Oh, yeah. Uh, Hugo de Stoop is one of the most competent um, operators and capital allocators in the industry. I'm a huge fan of, of Hugo. I'm a huge fan of what he's done at Euronav. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of what Fredrickson has done in shipping and what he means to shipping. I think the combination and marriage of those two fleets is very complementary. Um, I better be getting a paycheck from <laughs> Euronav for this. I have no position. I have no financial incentive here. Like I'm not long frontline or Euronav. And I just think it's good for the industry. Um, there's a opposition to the merger from a certain party. Um, I, I think it best to just say that I disagree and, and probably leave it at that. Okay. Uh, this was an interesting one. I've heard rumors of bulkers carrying containers sometimes over the last year or so. I'm curious how prevalent this is and that this could have some slight impacts on bulker market tightness. Have you heard about this? <laughs> yeah, I certainly heard about it. Um, in fact, Genco had a uh, bulker that they retrofitted a little bit to enable them to carry container boxes. I think uh, I think it was FedEx that, that did some sort of partnership. I want to say it was FedEx. Uh, I think Amazon might have also done something with this. It, it was uh, it was kind of weird because some of it was forty foot uh, high cubes, regular forty foot boxes like the ones you see on rail cars, and some of these were fifty three footers. And the fifty three foot was actually a special retrofit. And again, I think it was FedEx. Um, but no, I mean, it's a drop in the bucket. It's like, I don't want to say 1% of 1%. It might've been 10% of 1%, but it was very, very small. I mean, it was like a rounding error. It was kind of a so goofy. Like the guy could come out and call and be like, yeah, our bulker had containers on it. Like, it was just kind of, no, it's not a thing. I mean, it's a thing, but it's not like, it's not going to move the needle either way. And then the last one, the three best stocks to hold by the end of 2022. I mean, you touched on a lot of stocks already, mm -hmm. but do, do you share top three at all now for this year? Um, look, I mean, of companies that we talked about publicly, right? Because I, I cover about 50 names. Uh, we also cover some energy, energy infrastructure on, on Value Investors Edge in partnership with Michael Boyd. He's really the lead on, on the energy coverage. Um, I don't think it's fair to, you know, VIE just to go into our, our top list and, and just say like, these are the top five. I just don't think that's fair. But of the top, of the three, I'll give you three that I've talked about publicly. And, and they're on all three. These are on the top 10. Like, these aren't bad companies. Um, and they're all similar. Like, I mean, and, and there's people going to hate me. Like, the, you know, there's not a lot of diversity here. But Denouse Corp, DAC, the valuation on that company is just unbelievable. I just, I'm not, I'm not shot. Like I've seen this kind of stuff before. So I'm not like, I'm not like my head's not exploding that it's this cheap, but it, it just, it just disappoints me that the market's just dumb, that it doesn't like, I, I thought the market was a little smarter, but you know, anytime you think that you're going to get, you're going to be the one that looks dumb, <laughs> but uh, no DAC to now Corp is definitely up there. Um, another company I've talked about a lot publicly that I think most folks have probably never heard of. In fact, it's a company I didn't really know about until like two years ago, a year and a half ago. And that's Textainer Group, T-G-H. Uh, that's a box lessor. So just the 20 foot, 40 foot boxes, that's all they do. It's really, more, it's a financial company. It's really a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's a spreadsheet with some, they have some depot operations, repair operations. I, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but at the end of the day, it's a, a spreadsheet. And that's a, that's a very attractive company. The economics there are very, very good. The leases, the average lease duration is seven years long. All the leases they signed at the top were 10 to 14 years. 
So people are like, oh, the leases were at the top. They're unsustainable. Well, okay, dude, call me in 2032 and we can talk about it. <laughs> you know, like call me in 2034 and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out what the leases are at. The, shit, the box is only good for 14 years. So you have 14 year lease. Like who cares what the rate, you know, like it's going to be demolished at the end of it. Um, that company's astronomically cheap. I mean, it trades at like 30 bucks today. Our fair value estimate is 55. They have an active repurchase program. Last quarter, they repurchased about a million shares, just below a million shares at $37. So imagine how many they're repurchasing today at 30. Um, I would imagine one and a half million, maybe we'll see soon. Um, and they can only repurchase as the cash flow comes in, right? So they can't just, they're not gonna like take out a loan to repurchase more, right? They're not, they're not crazy, but they're gonna repurchase as the cash flow comes in. So Denaus Corp is one, uh, TGH is two. And then by the end of 22, huh? the timeline, because I want to just say, I, it, it would be easy for me to say, oh yeah, global ship GSO. But that's like, you know, Jay, like that's the same as dead, the AC, like you're just mirroring, <laughs> you're just copying something. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give one more company. And this is a little bit kind of VIE insider. I don't think I talk about this company much. It's been on our buy list for a long time. OSG, Overseas Shipping Group, another stupid name. They have nothing that's overseas. <laughs> it's all domestic Jones Act. They, they have one international flag tanker out of like, 30 ships total that they work with. So like an overseas, it's a stupid name. Anyways, this company got a takeover offer last summer for $3. It fell through because $3 was not high enough. The company didn't want to sell and the insiders didn't want to sell for $3. Now the company is like $2 and uh, I don't know, 2 dollars a today. Let's look it up real quick. Let me turn off the PSP. This is uh, June 15th, by the way. Uh, $2.18 today. They just enabled a 5 million share repurchase program. 5 million shares was the authorization. The company only has like 90 million shares total. So that's a pretty big chunk of, of shares there. You know, um, was that 6%, 7% share repurchase authorization. And everything at the company is monumentally better than it was a year ago when they got that $3 offer for a takeover. So if that same company, it's called Salt Chuck Logistics. It's a small company. Well, not small company. It's a regional company based out of Seattle, Washington. If Salt Chuck comes back to the table and wants to buy OSG, I uh, I don't know. I don't even know where they would start. They would have to start the bid. I would think 350, 375 would be the starting point. And I, and I think we could, I, I, re, I reasonably believe we could see a takeover as high as four, maybe even into the low fours. Um, so that's kind of a special situation. I would say coin flip, literally coin flip 50, 50, Chris, 50% uh, odds that that company is either taken over or in the process of receiving a takeover bid by December 31st. So three companies, one of them is a little bonus that maybe people have never heard of. That, that's perfect. Just the last topic before we start to wrap up, Jay. Uh, I know you're headed to Marine Money soon. So, I mean, the conferences are, are all back after COVID, I guess. So what do you think will be the biggest themes coming up in, at Marine Money in New York? And what are you looking forward to? Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I'm super excited about Marine Money. It's been three years since we all got together there in New York. And last time I was in New York in 2019, uh, I, I don't think you followed shipping back then, but there's some pictures of me. I had a black eye, <laughs> a little bit of an accident uh, right, before, right before the shift started. And so I was going around Marine Money and I had 26 company meetings set up and he had this big ass shiner, you know, and I'm on a panel and all this goofy stuff. So it's going to be fun to go back. I'm hoping I don't get a black eye this time. <laughs> but no, I, I think... I think enthusiasm would have been much higher two or three months ago. I think the looming global recession and, and the big collapse we've seen in, in some of these stock prices are, are going to weigh on sentiment a little bit. I don't think we're going to be popping quite as much champagne as we thought we might be, might be popping. I, I think the number one theme, Chris, is, is really going to be focused on environmental regulations. Things like carbon credits, things like uh, sustainable linked financing, uh, things like uh, new build transition, new propulsion systems. Uh, re uh, responsible recycling and demolition. Um, I think those are really kind of the themes that are interesting. Um, maybe for me as an investor, maybe not so much, but I think at the conference, because keep in mind, this is an industry conference. You have the, you have the companies, you have the lawyers, you have the consultants, you have, you know, you have everybody there. So it's not just investors. In fact, investors are the smallest demographic that are probably going to be at this conference. In fact, um, in 2019, which was, as you probably remember, it was a good time to be buying shipping stocks. Uh, there's like 10 <laughs> investors in like the room. There's like, and there's like a thousand, 500 people there and there's like 10 that are actual investors. So I'm hoping there's more investors this time around, a little bit less champagne than we thought and a lot of focus on responsibility, sustainability, climate, that sort of stuff. 
I, I mean, people say that all the time, shipping is a people business. So I'm just curious to ask you, what kind of information do you feel like you get from attending these physical events that you wouldn't be able to grasp sort of in a spreadsheet or reading analyst mm-hmm. reports, et cetera? What are you sort of looking for and why is it important to attend to sort of get the feel? Is there something like, you know, talking to the CEOs, some, some information that you just have to be there in order to collect? From like a modeling perspective and from like a trading perspective, like, no, you don't need to be there. Um, um, Sorry, Matt and Jim. And, you know, you don't need, they don't need to go to your conference, but no, 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 no. From an actual like business development perspective and from a deep understanding of the sector, like you would be crazy not to go to shipping, uh, to Marine Money Conference to learn about shipping. So like, you know, I tell folks, if, if you live in the New York, you know, region, Northeast region, and you have substantial money invested in shipping, like buying a ticket to marine money is the best investment you can make. And the tickets aren't cheap. They're $3,000 or something for, for the three days, but it's well worth your money because you're going to meet probably half or more of the shipping execs are going to be there. And normally it'd be like 75%, but I think we're still kind of reopening and still kind of, you know, trying to, international travel is still a little tricky. Um, but no, I mean, as far as like becoming comfortable with the management, uh, the leadership, learning about competencies, uh, I think when you meet somebody and you shake their hand and you put a name to a face and you can sit down and have a coffee together or maybe a beer, um, you get a little bit more comfortable with who's managing your your shipping stocks or your in your portfolio your portfolio and all that sort of thing. I, I think there's this general misconception and it's a really bad one that shipping is like full of a bunch of idiots and like they're all scoundrels or whatnot. And the truth is, many of these shipping companies. Okay. Well, first of all, there, there is always some truth. Anytime there's a rumor or something, there's always something there, right? But most of the shipping companies, especially the European ones, have phenomenal corporate governance. I mean, you look at companies like, like uh, Euronav or Torm, or on the US side, you have companies like Starbulk, Eagle Bulk. The corporate governance at these companies is fantastic. In fact, it's better than the corporate governance at most of the firms in the S&P 500. So like this, 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 there's this misperception that shipping has like this terrible governance. Secondly, there's this misperception that a lot of shipping managers are just idiots. They love ships, you know, like they just measure their worth by how many ships they own. I, I think when you interact with the folks and get to know them and, and talk their strategy and understand their history and understand, you know, their involvement in shipping for decades and decades, these guys have seen more cycles than, you know, I can remember and they've witnessed it and experienced it. Um, you understand maybe some of the decisions they make. And you understand a little bit more about the capital allocation. There's so many people on Twitter that are sitting in their in their armchairs or their gamer chairs, and, and they're sitting there and they're just they they act like they can run these shipping companies better, or like they know where best to put the next dollar. Hey, dividends, dollar in your pocket, dollar in my pocket. I love it, right? But there's people that are literally saying, like last year, for instance, there was I'm going off on a little rant here, but last year there was a couple of companies that ordered. The dirtiest word, man, they ordered speculative new builds in container ships. One of the companies was Euroseas, YesEA. One of the other companies was Navios Partners, NMM. NMM ordered 10. Uh, Euroseas has now ordered nine, but they started off with just ordering three. Now they've ordered nine. NMM has fixed all 10 of those speculative new builds, which by the way, they got derided on, on Twitter and all these places, Ben Twit. People just don't know they don't know anything about shipping. They're just deriding. How dumb are you to order a speculative new bill? Oh, I mean, you seen the order book. And NMM has fixed all 10 of these ships on charters that pay for the entire ship in like five years. And it's a ship that's built for 30 years. The latest environmental specifications, it's going to outperform other ships by $20,000 per day. And they already paid for the entire ship in the first five years. Euroseas did one better. They bought nine speculative new builds total. They've already fixed the first two. Now, we, the, next, the jury's out on the next seven. They fixed the first two at a charter that's so high that it pays for the entire ship in three years. And this is a ship that has 30 years of life, the latest environmental specs. They paid for the ship in three years, the first charter. So I, the reason why, and it's a long-winded answer, but if you go to Marine Money, you can sit down with folks like the CEO and CFO of Euroseas and be like, wow, these guys have been in shipping their entire lives. They've seen so many cycles. They know what they're doing. They're not they're not idiots, right? And, and, and you can learn those nuances that you can't get from a spreadsheet, that you can't get from tweeting at people. And, and you can meet other people. Like I'm going to meet people that I only know online from Twitter. And, you know, hopefully, we'll, hopefully that'll be great. 
Hopefully we'll be able to share information and build relationships that you just can't build online. I mean, Twitter is kind of a funny place. <laughs> No, no, but I couldn't agree more. Like sometimes, I mean, I mean you get so much more uh, data points by meeting a person. And, and like you said, it's also easier to understand them in hindsight, right? Once they take a decision and after knowing them, you can maybe understand their thought process. So I just want to end it there, Jay, but uh, it was fantastic to have you on again. I mean, you, there was so many things we talked about. So I just want to thank you so much for taking the time once again, and I hope we can continue this tradition in the future as well. Yeah, no, absolutely, Chris. Uh, let's definitely continue this uh, check-in. Check in with me no near the end of the year, and we'll see uh, the three stocks, DAC, right, um, OSG, and TGH. Let's put those up on the tracker. And look, in six months, if they're down, you can make fun of me and drive me, and I will say, hey, look, I was wrong. But hopefully, those three will be looking pretty good in six months to a year. That's a perfect deal. Okay, thank you so much, Shay. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you learned something new. If you like this content, please make sure to subscribe to the channel. See you later.